guys for that. This week and next week, we're talking about heaven. Now, heaven is a term, it's a word that comes with a whole bunch of thoughts and feelings and emotions. All that stuff comes with heaven. There's, when you talk about it, it's, well, do you believe in it? Do you not believe in it? Well, even if you don't believe in heaven, every religion, every faith, you know, every even yoga class has some version of when you die, you go to a good place or you go to a bad place. You know, there's very few people that actually are like true, true, true atheists that believe that when you die, you close your eyes and then poof, you're gone. That's the end. Uh, you turn to dust. You either get spread off of Table Mountain or you get buried in the ground but it's over and it's done. I believe that for the majority of us, even if, you're, if you feel that way now, I believe that for the majority of us, at the end of the day, we need to know that there is an eternity. We, we need that. We need to know that there is something on the other side of this life. It, it, it brings meaning to this life. It gives us something to hope towards, something uh, to look forward to. But if there's nothing, I mean, I can't imagine this, the thought of, okay, there's nothing to come after this. If there's nothing to come after this, then what does it matter with what we do here in this life? You know, I just can't imagine that. But I believe that when push comes to shove, that most people, at the end of the day, do want there to be an eternity. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, my, I have one of my grandmothers, when she passed away a long time ago, uh, she was old, uh, it was natural, she was in uh, the hospital, and it was really, you know, it's, I, it's, I'm not saying this to be sad, it was really a, a beautiful, you know, as beautiful as something like that can be, but we were there with her, and I remember in her last, um, like, days, last day, last hours, she was so joyful about what was coming next. You know, like she just, she couldn't, she just couldn't wait. She said, I, I, I can't wait to go home. That, that was what she said. And, and, and that is something I thought like in that moment, and this was probably 12, 13, 15 years ago, but I, I, I thought like, man, I, I want that. I want to be in that place, you know, at the end of my life. In contrast to that, I have, a, I had a grandfather who spent his entire life not believing in God or Jesus or Buddha or any... I mean, he believed in nothing, had no beliefs. He was a guy that really believed that when you close your eyes, you just, that's it, that's the end. And he got to a place, he had lung cancer from smoking, and he, he was basically on his deathbed. And we had gotten a phone call that was, you need to come down to the hospital, uh, your grandfather, or he's talking to my... my Mom, you know, your father, he, it's not that he has days, it's he has hours or he has minutes. And she made a phone call to uh, my pastor at the time, a guy named Dr. Chris Stevens, and he went down to the hospital and he walked into that room and he went right up to him and he said, Les, in a matter of hours potentially, you're going to pass. Now what's going to happen? What do you want when you close your eyes for the last time? And that old, stubborn man who spent his entire life not believing in God in that moment said, I'm afraid I want to go to heaven. And he led him to Jesus right then and there. Now, I, I, I use that to, to say that most people need there to be an eternity. You may not feel a need for it now, but you do have a need for that. And so that means we've got to ask this question. Okay, who goes there? And if you don't believe in heaven, whatever it is that you do believe in, that you can apply almost all of this to that. Here in this church, we believe in heaven, we believe in hell. That's, that's uh, us as a Christian church. But you could sort of use this for any religion here. So I don't want to single anybody out. You can apply this to your own logic. I'm going to give you some logic and let you think through it and let you work through it. But who is it that goes to heaven? So an easy way to answer that. The way that most of us would answer, or a lot of people would answer it, is that good people go to heaven. That, that's the easy answer. And it makes sense. Good people go to heaven. The next step to this line of thinking is that I am a good person. Okay? So that's, that's the theory. That's the way of thinking. Good people go to heaven, and I'm a good person. Now, I understand why this is so uh, attractive. Because this means that I 
can do something in my own control to make sure that I get to go to the good place when I pass on. Because I'm a good person and good people go to heaven. And it, it's got some other advantages to it. But, and I, I want to give those to you here. But good people go to heaven and I'm a good person. I, I'm going to refer to that as a, as a theory today. You may accidentally hear me call that a theology. But I'm going to call it a theory because it's not proven. No one has gone to heaven and come back and said, guys, I figured it out. You only have to be good, <clears throat> you know. They've not done that. And so that's why I'm going to refer to this as a, as a theory. So here's the advantages. And I don't want to ignore these, these advantages. So the advantage to the I'm, good people go to heaven and I'm a good person is, okay, number one, it's just. So that means it's fair, obvious. A good person should go to the good place. A bad person should go to the bad place. It shouldn't be a bad person goes to the good place and a good person goes to the bad place. So if good people go to heaven and I'm a good person, it's only just, it's only fair that I get to go to heaven. That's a great advantage to this way of thinking because it, it's, it's okay, well, I mean, that's, that's me. And then that, this next one sort of reinforces it is that, okay, obviously you're going to make the cut, meaning like you're a good person. So I want to do an exercise with you. I, don't look at your neighbor. Don't point at your neighbor. Don't nudge your neighbor. I just want you to think about your neighbor in your seat next to you there. Now, you know that you're better than they are. You know that you're a good person. Some of you that are, you know, you're sitting next to a partner or a spouse or a friend, you're like, I know I'm way better, you know. If they're going to heaven, I'm getting crowns, you know. So, I mean, it's kind of the way that we see ourselves. It's like, okay, even if I do bad things, I know that deep down inside... I'm a good person. You know, this morning, I let frustrations, you know, uh, get, get to me this morning. I sort of, I didn't, I didn't blow my top, but I just said things that as soon as I walked away, I was like, oh, that was dumb, you know. Why did you do that? And I, I do that, you know, a lot. Turned around, told the guy, I was like, hey, man, I'm sorry. That's my bad. Wasn't a big deal. I didn't throw anything at anybody. I didn't cuss anybody out, so don't speculate on that. I just wasn't like super understanding of something. So, but deep down inside, I'm a good person. I mean, I'm, I'm up here talking to you guys. Obviously, you know, I, I have like, I permanently make the cut, right? Because of me up here, you know? So, I mean, I wish it worked that way, but, um, but this is an advantage because very few people would say, yeah, I'm not a good person, you know? Yeah, I don't deserve that. You know, maybe in our depression or, or feeling low about ourselves, we could say, you know what, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve anything. But most of us sitting here that are semi kind of healthy, we would say, yeah, I make, I make the cut, obviously. Now, the third advantage, there's, there's, there's more. It supports the notion of a good God. So if, it, it's like it proves itself. If good people go to heaven and I'm good enough, then that supports that God is good. So it's like a self-supporting argument. And then if God is good, then good people go to heaven. And because good people go to heaven, God is good. And it just continues to support itself. Now, the fourth advantage to this way of thinking is the fear of not going. Now, those of you, who, I don't know, who grew up with fire and brimstone preachers, you know? You're going to go to hell and if you don't repent and give your life to Jesus, you know, you're going to go to hell and you're going to die. And, uh, and so what they were using in a not very kind way or even biblical way is the fear of not going to heaven should motivate people to be good. So that means that when I'm sitting at a robot or I'm pulling up to a robot, and I talk about traffic a lot in my sermons because I drive a kid to Rhonda Bosch back and forth, and so I deal with that some. But sitting at a robot, and someone stops at a yellow light. Who stops at a yellow light? All right? You know? When, I, when, I, when you think it's going to turn yellow, everyone should speed up. And then when it does turn yellow, you should speed up. And after it turns red, there's a standing rule that the next seven cars go through on red, Right? Okay, but every now and again, you'll get somebody that just stops on yellow, causes a nine-car pileup behind us because they're not playing by the rules. 
But instead of sitting there in my, in my vehicle, or not my vehicle, because I'm listening to worship music and everything is wonderful, in your vehicle, um, you know, instead of getting out and dragging them out of the car and telling them, hey, you know, this is what I think about you kindly in this moment, let me introduce you to Jesus, you'd say, no, I'm a, I, want, I need to be good because I want to go to heaven. Like, I'm motivated. It, it means that all those moments and times when I made the decision to be calm and be good, it's for a reason. There is a payoff at the end here. And the payoff is that I get to go to the good place. So these are four, four advantages to the theory of good people go to heaven and I am a good person. And logically, it kind of makes sense. And I understand why this is so attractive to people. This is attractive to people because not only do we want there to be an eternity, but we want to, we want to be able to know that we've done something to get there or that there is something we can do in order to get there. If, if good people go, then you could say, okay, at the end of the day, I know that if I'm good, then I'm okay. And I, I hear this all the time at, at funerals. Every funeral I've been to, I don't know if every person that has passed away that I've been to their funeral is in heaven or not, but I know that every single one that I've been to, they've said they were a good person. And because they were a good person, I'm sure that they're in heaven. I'm sure that they're with, with angels. Or they were a good person. They're looking down on us from heaven right now. You know, just because you're good enough for here, I don't, I don't know that you're good enough for there. But we want the comfort that if I'm good enough for here, then I'm good enough for there. But there's a problem with this. There's a big problem with the good people go to heaven theory. Big problem. And this problem is, is that if you believe in this theory, it comes with what I'm calling these unsettling realities. And I've got a few of them for you. Now, as I unpack these for you, or as I, as I explain them to you, these things are true for those that believe that good people go to heaven. So if you believe that good people go to heaven, then that means that these are undeniably true, which is why I've called it an unsettling reality. The good people go to heaven is a theory, but if you believe that theory, then you've got to deal with a reality. And the reality is, is that you're probably going to be bothered a little bit in the next few minutes. So the number one, not in any particular order, the number one unsettling reality is there is no indisputable, agreed upon, divinely revealed standard of good. And what that means is that good is a moving target. So what's good for me may not be good for you. What's, what's good for uh, someone living in one place may not be good for someone living in another place. Uh, you know, I, I, I used an example in the first service this morning. I think we got the dates wrong. Uh, so correct me if I get this wrong because I'm going to try here. So in 1994, all women got the ability to vote, right? It's okay, right? Okay, get, getting some, we'll make sure I get that right. Okay, so what that means, because women were created in the image of God. Women uh, are people just like men. Women are, you know, like amazing. You know, women are equals, all, all that stuff. And I know that women, you're still fighting like an uphill battle. So I don't want to diminish anything that you struggle with. This is an oversimplified example here. Okay. So that means that before 1994, there were no men in heaven because they didn't see women as having the right to vote. And that's bad. Women having the right to vote is good. Women not having the right to vote is bad. So if good people go to heaven, then no one before 1994 would be in heaven. Or no men, no lawmakers. See, that's sort of like good as a moving target. Because then it was fine. It was good. Now it's not good. See, we can apply that to a whole bunch of things. You know, I've, I've had the ability to travel around the world, and there are things that certain cultures do that are not good in other cultures. The, the point to this is, is that like, good is a moving target. And the fact that there is no indisputable standard rule of good, especially across generations, 
Every generation, good changes. And the fact that there is no standard, well, that's an unsettling reality. That's, that's, that would unsettle me. If all of a sudden I find out that, okay, in or, if good is good enough, but what's the standard of good? I don't know. You know, the, the other part to this, if we're talking about standards, according to, to God, according to our God here, is that you, you don't make the cut. You think you do, but you don't. R- Romans chapter 3, this is Paul uh, talking about uh, this truth that God, that Jesus, you know, the whole reason we needed Jesus here is that in verse 10, as it is written and forever remains written, there is none righteous. So that's not you, not your grandma, not your brother, your sister, not, definitely not uh, me, none, 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 none. None that meets God's standard, no, not even one. And then in verse 20, for no person, that's none, will be justified, which means freed of guilt and declared righteous in his sight. Nobody is good enough, no matter how much of the works of the law, no matter how much good you do, nobody is ever good enough. The, the second reality that you've got to deal with here, is very unsettling here. This, I'm just using logic here. We don't know what percent of our actions have to be good to make the cut. Do we need 51%? Do we need 49%? Do we need 70? Do we need 80? Do, do we only need 20%? You know, is, is God following the matric system where whatever you need to matric is what you need to get into heaven? You know? Well, but we, we don't know what percent. How, how do we, if good people go to heaven, how do we know if we're good or not? What percent has to be good? 100%? 1%? And the other part to this is, at what age do your actions start to count towards your percent of good or bad? We don't know. We can't answer any of that. You know, and then to take it another step further, even if you are doing good things or you're doing bad things, this third unsettling reality is that we don't know if our thoughts and motives count against us. So you could do 10 good things, but with the wrong motive. Well, is that good or is that bad? You could do bad things, but with the good motive. Does that count for good? Does that count for bad? Who's the judge of your motive? Who, you know, th- this is like, if you believe that good people go to heaven, then the reality is, is that we can't answer these very important questions about what's good and what is not good. Again, uh, we have another one here for you. Number four, it says that we could already be out of time. So for those that are old here in the room, for those that are, you know, anyone above uh, 41, you're super old. We'll consider you, you yeah, (laughs) keeps me under the, under the, no. You know, this thing of like, hey, we could be out of time. Let's say, let's say you're at 49% and you need to get to 51%. How much time or how many good deeds do you have to do to cross the threshold to 51%? Maybe you are out of time. Maybe you've got plenty of time. Maybe, maybe you're out of time. I don't know. If we don't know the percent, if we don't know what counts for it, if we don't know what it is that makes us good or not good, then there's, there's no way to know. It may take five years of good to earn 1% of goodness. Or it may take one action or one kind thought, but the point is, is we don't know. How, how, wouldn't it be horrible, even if the good people go to heaven theory was true, for you to get like, a, like an SMS that says you've officially run out of time, you know? It's, but we, we don't know. Number five, the last one here, this last unsettling reality is we could miss heaven by one good deed means that you've worked hard to get to 51%. And you, you get you get same thing, you get an SMS from heaven. You know, hello, Mr. Ladd, we'd like to welcome you to heaven. You've officially hit 51%. And while I'm reading that SMS, the person in front of me stops at a yellow light, and I rear in them. And then I get out, and I give them a piece of my mind, and immediately I get an SMS that says, uh, Dear Mr. Christopher Ladd, you drop back down to 49%. And then I get hit by lightning, and I die. I've now, now where am I? Because that line of good was like, I was there, I wasn't there, I did one thing and I lost it. The point is, is that we, 
We don't know. See, th- these are realities that you have to deal with. If you subscribe to the theory that good people go to heaven, and this is all these, these realities, th- this isn't realities based on the Bible. This is just realities based on logic of what is good. And so for those of you, some of you now may be feeling like a little bit unsettled, and I, I want to recognize that. If you're like, oh, well, okay, well, thanks, Pastor Chris. Now who knows where I'm going? I, I don't know where I'm going or what's happening. And in fact, there's some people that I, that I know, I've had conversations with people about things like this that would say, you know what? If good people go to, if the theory of good people go to heaven isn't true, then maybe God is not good. Maybe that's the reality, is that God just isn't good. Because see, we've been making an assumption that God is the same kind of good that we need him to be so that our good gets us to the good place. And so if you're learning for the first time this morning that actually you're never going to get to the good place based on being good, then you know what? God is not good. It's kind of like, let's imagine that God is a teacher. And as a teacher, God is going to give you a test. And in this class, in this course, one test is going to determine your entire grade, the the grade for the entire course. And when you take that test, that grade that you get determines whether or not you pass or fail. And then whether or not you pass or fail dictates everything to follow about your life to come. But the teacher doesn't give you a study guide, doesn't give you a date. So you don't even know when the test is. You don't know what to study. They don't give you notes. And when you show up to class every day... The teacher never shows up. And then all of a sudden, you get the test. And then after you take the test, they don't give you the grade. What kind of, that's that's not a good teacher. That's a bad teacher. Kind of sounds like the God that comes with those unsettling realities. And what about a boss? Some people, we could say, okay, God sounds a little bit like my boss at work. Not my boss, but your boss. And it would be, okay, you've got a performance review coming up. And in this performance review, it's going to determine your, uh, your pay, your pay grade. You've done your three-month kind of uh, probation period. It's going to determine all kinds of stuff for you for work. But you don't know what you're judged on. You don't know the criteria. You don't know exactly when the performance review is. Uh, you don't even know your job title. You don't know what your areas of responsibility are. You don't know what your KPIs are. You don't know how to win, how not to win. You just kind of show up and play solitaire on your computer, which some of you do anyway, and, and you hope that that's, that that's good enough. That's not a good boss, and that's not a good teacher, and that's not a good God. And if we take the boss and teacher and we apply it to God, that leaves us kind of with this statement of that we, we are supposed to be good so that we can go be with a good God who never defined the terms and failed to tell us how good is good enough. And so this is a fairly fair uh, depiction of God. You, this, if you think this right now, that's okay, and I can understand it. I can totally understand why. We're supposed to be good, but there is no definition of good. No one has defined it. No one's given the terms. And we don't know how good is good enough. Because see, if God is good, if God is good, then what he's going to do is every generation, he's going to give us a a list of this is what it means to be good enough. It means that when we travel, you're going to take your passport And when you get your passport stamped at the border or at the airport, they're going to give you the list for that country on what it takes to be good enough to get into heaven. And every year that culture changes, every year there's an election, every year that something in society changes, God is going to say, here it is. And then he's going to give you like a testing kit. Like you know how uh, you have when you test your pool water, you dip the little strip in there. God's going to say, everyone go pee on the strip and it's going to tell you what percentage of good you are. Wouldn't Wouldn't that be fun? You know, how do you know whether you're good or you're bad? Well, here you go. Here's your testing strips. This is this is what a good God, what what our definition of what a good God would be and how a good God would be for us. And if you if you feel this way, I I just want to say you're welcome here, and I understand because see we we want to know how we can get into heaven. We want to be in charge of our eternity. That's a natural thing. 
And the good enough theory is tell me how I can be good enough so that I can know what to do so that I can get to heaven. Tell me how you can be good enough so that you know what to do, so that you can qualify, so that you can do what you need to do, so that you can go to heaven. You see what, I don't know if you're picking up on that, but the good people go to heaven is all about you. It puts the focus on you. It puts the focus on me. It puts the focus on I. I have to do, you have to do in order to earn that position. And then you get to be the judge of whether or not you qualify for it. See, it puts everything on you. And if everything is on you, then you don't need faith. You don't need trust. You don't need suffering with purpose. You don't need any of that. Because you know what you need to do in order for you to go to the good place. But that's just not how it works. And I'm thankful that it doesn't work that way. See, this guy Jesus came. And Jesus changed it for everybody. Jesus changed it forever, for all of eternity. Because, see, I, I've got, I have better news for you than good people go to heaven. There is better news. So if Jesus is who his first century followers said that he was, then we've got good news. So we're, gonna use, we're using the word good a lot here. The, the meaning of good is going to continue to change. But I have, I, I have good news for you. I, I can't guarantee a lot of things in your life or anything really in your life. But what I say from here on out, I can guarantee as true. I can guarantee that you can take it and you can put your entire life invested in it. You can lean your entire life on it. You can bet your entire life on it. Everything from here on out, I know without a question, without a shadow of a doubt, that this is true and this is real and this is unshakable. And it's not about good getting you into heaven. But when Jesus came, he doesn't ignore good. In fact, one of the first things he tells his disciples is to be good. So when you read about being good in the Bible, it's not so that you can get into heaven. It's because Jesus wants us to reflect his heart. His heart is good. His heart is loving. It's kindness. It's forgiveness. It's gentleness. Jesus tells the disciples to go out and be good. Because there's no excuse to not be good or to not to try and be good. And then he tells them to also do good. So, yeah, there's, a, there's an identity attached to good. There's a doing that's attached to good. So Jesus isn't uh, negating the good. But what he is saying is that this has nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven or whether or not there is an eternity waiting for you. Did you know uh, that in the Old Testament... Uh, this is crazy to me, mind-blowing to me. In the Old Testament, there is no mention or theology of heaven. There, there's, there's, like, uh, there's messianic scriptures that talk about the, the, the coming of Jesus and things like that, but there's, no, there's just Sheol. There's no theology of heaven. It, it only comes in after Jesus comes. You know, After the, that middle part in your Bible where it says New Testament and then Matthew, from there on... That's where heaven comes into play. Because Jesus was that much of a difference. He's the difference maker. And so let me explain to you how to go to heaven. Let me explain to you who goes to heaven. John 3.16. Let me tell you about the, the motive behind God here. The motive behind God is that for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that God's motive for doing everything that he did is love. It's not about doing good, it's about being loved. It's, it, it's not about uh, earning something, it's about God loving you. It's not about what you can give, it's about what you're receiving. And we've got this creator, this God in heaven, who saw you when you woke up this morning, he saw you last night, he was with you, he was with you as you crossed the parking lot, he's with you now as you sit in here right now, he's with you for your whole life, And he's here to say to you today, right now, some of you need to know it, some of you need the reminder for it, that God so greatly loved you. That's his motivation for the rest of John 3.16. It's love. It's not God so greatly loved you because you were good. 
It's not God so greatly uh, graded you as good or bad. It's God so greatly loved. You can never do enough good, but you can let go and be loved enough. And it's being loved enough that changes your eternity, not being good enough. So God, under this motivation, he dearly prized the world so that he even gave his one and only begotten list, right? God gave a list, right? A list. Okay, here, here because I love you so much, I'm going to give you my one and only begotten list. This is how to be good. Da, 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 you know, check it off. No, it's not list. It's he gave his one and only begotten son. It's about him giving a display of love does not come in a list. A display of love from God came from giving his son for us. And then it, God goes on here and, and he says in the next part of this verse, so that whoever behaves, right? It's whoever behaves, whoever does the good things to get into the good place. No, that's not there. Let me get that clear. This is not in Scripture. Instead, it's so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but instead have eternal life. It's about believing not behaving. It's about the sun and not the list. It's not about being good. It's about being loved. See, instead of giving us a list, he gave us himself. That was the gift that he gave for us. And then just to reinforce this here, God did not send Jesus to come and grade you like a boss or a school teacher. In verse 17, it says, for God did not, for God did not send the son into the world to judge and then condemn the world. It's not about condemnation. But instead, here's your guarantee. Instead, it's so that the world might be saved through him. It's the love of God. It's, it's not doing good that gets you into heaven. It's the love of God that gets you into heaven. It's the love of God that earns your position with him. See, I, I, I believe that This whole sermon series, and next week we're going to talk about the next steps to this. This whole thing is really based around the fact that we've lost the understanding of our position with God. Because if we really knew where our position with God was, a position under love, a position of salvation, if we really knew that, then it wouldn't be about doing good. You know, it it would be about being loved. Our kids at home are not worried about doing good. I can promise you that. But it's because they know that they're loved. You know, they they act up the most around us because they know that they're loved the most around us. It's not about good. It's about being loved. Jesus here, Jesus, this last, one of the last truths I want to leave you with. See, Jesus needed to only come one time. The standard wasn't, every generation, every culture. No, no, no. Jesus came one time. He doesn't need to come every 50 years to reestablish it, every 100 years to reestablish it. Once, one time, one time only. He is the standard of good because it's his love, which only needed one time, that took care of all of our eternities. So Jesus, he only needed to come one time. He did not give us a to-do list or a good enough list. He gave us a who That's himself. And he invited all of us to a place, to place our trust in him. That's how we know who goes to heaven. Because you've believed and you've put your trust in him. So I'm going to give you an opportunity here as we close in prayer. If you've never believed or put your trust in Jesus, then do that today. If if you've thought that you could be good enough to get into heaven, then today... I can give you the opportunity to be loved enough to get into heaven. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to understand. You don't have to uh, live in a certain mold. All I'm asking you to do today is believe. And if you already believe, then I hope today is a reminder of your position where everywhere else in your life, you may have to feel like you've got to be good enough. But with God, you never have to worry about it. Because you're loved enough. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to lead us in a prayer of salvation. Today's the day that if you've never given your life to Christ, today's the day that you can do that. 
And here's the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I know my sins should separate me from you forever. I believe your son Jesus died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so that I could live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my Savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.